Well, it's a really good thing that my kids have grown up and started families of their own. Otherwise, it would have been difficult to justify four months of preparation for a 12-minute talk. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here today to do this. Um, I've trekked through um, the Ebo Forest in Cameroon where I worried about running into poachers and forest elephants. I was bit in the face by a poisonous centipede in the jungles of northeastern Madagascar, but I have to confess, my knees have never knocked like they are now. <laughs> so, um, my first exposure to wildlife, like most people, well, actually, I have to tell you, I went to school to study wildlife, not as a get-rich-quick scheme. <laughs> it, it's, it's true. That was not the idea. <clears throat> I went there because I loved animals. And I think that most people who get into biology and conservation biology do exactly that. And that's the reason that we so often fail in our work, because in the end, saving things is more about people than it is about animals. In any event, my early exposure to wildlife came in front of theaters and the television, and one of the first classes was with Bambi. And I think you all remember the story of Bambi. Uh, it was a complicated story, a drama about the struggles of Bambi, Mr. Possum, and Thumper, and all of their friends. But my childhood takeaway was of the hunter. <laughs> the man who shot Bambi's mom. And my takeaway was is that this was a bad man, and it was a simple problem with a simple solution. Find out who's destroying wildlife, find out who's destroying wildlife habitats, and you outlaw it. You're done. I could be a conservation biologist. You could be a conservation biologist. <laughs> we could all go on and do that work. But it's a little more complicated than that. I had the privilege of growing up in Southern California with wildlife virtually at my fingertips. So it was only natural, once I decided I was not going to shoot them, sorry about the gunshot, um, that I would go to work for the San Diego Zoo where I could take care of animals. And it was there I was pre presented with the remarkable opportunity to work with an extraordinary bird, the recovery of the California condor. Conservation biologists presented with the simple problem, there were only 22 condors, found a really good solution. We bred them just as fast as we could and turned them loose. Now there's 380 of them and we're all set, right? Wrong. The California condor is no closer to recovery today than it was when we started. The real threat to the future of the California condor is lead poisoning, and lead poisoning remains a part of the environment even today. With the Arabian oryx, when it was extirpated from Oman, it was a simple problem with a simple solution. The Sultan of Oman banned hunting under the penalty of death, I might add. Zoos bred a lot of oryx, and for 30 years, and with millions of dollars, we kept turning them loose. Then 90% of the reserve was opened up to oil exploration, and today, the wild oryx in Oman is no more. The failure of so many of these single species conservation programs should be a signal to conservation biologists, pardon me. There seems to be one exception, though, and that's the remarkable recovery of the peregrine falcon. Studied and bred for years and released in droves, this bird's becoming more and more common in our skies. But I think if you examine it clo more closely, you'll find that the peregrine falcon is recovering not from captive breeding, but because we banned DDT. And DDT was only banned when scientists discovered in their studies of what it was doing to animals that it might not be all that good for people either. In 1995, I had the opportunity to go and work in northeastern Madagascar. And on my first trek across the Maswal Peninsula, I just discovered this little community of Antanambao. No running water, no electricity, no written history. A group of people virtually on the edge of nowhere. And in 1997, I was given the job of going back and living in Antanambao to teach them about conservation. <laughs> but like most of conservation, it was not going to be as simple as you think. I was funny looking. <laughs> right? I spoke in a language they didn't understand, and I was very threatening. One villager pulled me aside, and he told me, they believe that you will eat small children and steal the spirits of adults. <laughs> as I looked at the photo, I realized, this is how most conservationists look to everyone else in the world. <laughs> we speak in a language you don't really understand, and the things we're telling you seem to be a threat to your way of life. That needs to change. Being different made it very difficult for me. 
It was hard to integrate, but I noticed this little boy one day hiding in the bushes behind me. I put my hand behind my back and counted in Gasi. Are, garu, tela. One, two, three. Until over a period of hours and even days, Elian and I became friends. We became dear friends and fell in love with each other. Enough so that by the time it came time for me to leave Antanambao, his mom met me as I exited the community with Elian, his bags packed, and asked me to take him home with me. I've never felt like I could adequately explain to his mom or to Elian why he had to stay and I had to go. It was only a short time later that I heard that a huge storm, the mother of all storms, had hit northeastern Madagascar, and it had catastrophic consequences for the village of Antanambao. This storm literally wiped Antanambao off the map. I went back to all of the organizations who had supported my work over the years, and they were all conservation groups, and they said, no, we can't help. You're a biologist, and this is about people. And that's when I realized our strategy with conservation had to change. Um, no one would pay for me to go back and help and find my friends and do any work. And it described, underlined for me, the disconnect between what we do in conservation biology and the reality of how people live all over the world. So as I said, what I took away from that was the realization that we had to connect better. I carried my memories of Elian and the change in my conservation philosophy onto a new program with the Eastern Monarch Butterfly. This remarkable butterfly migrates through North America and ends up in central Mexico, a migration beyond description. It will encompass an entire year, take five to six generations to complete, and in the end, they will have covered five to 6,000 miles. These butterflies begin to arrive in the high mountains of the Sierra Madres in Michoacan, right around Dia de los Muertos. The Day of the Dead ceremonies are launched by the arrival of the monarch butterfly, who they believe, from, from the time of Aztecs, that lost loved ones would return in the form of a butterfly. Gradually, these butterflies begin to coat the vegetation and to fill the sky with orange and black snowflakes, like in any good storm that begin to blot the sky from our view. Ultimately, they begin to cover the OML fir trees from the top to the bottom, in a rich cloak of ore that's able to change from gold to silver. Only 20 years ago, one billion monarch butterflies migrated into central Mexico. 530 tons of butterflies would coat the forest for the winter with their wings. Come springtime, this beautiful cloak would slip off the tree in a roar of millions upon millions of wings as the butterflies take to the air. This is a rite of spring to be reveled in, a rite of spring that occurs nowhere else on Earth but in the OML fir forest. These OML fir forests have been important not only to the migration of the butterfly, but to the Aztecs, the Purapechans, and the Masaguas, and the people of our time. But these forests are threatened, not just by illegal loggers. This tree was not cut by loggers. This tree was cut for fuel and will leave the forest one branch at a time, an army of people carrying out wood to cook and stay warm. <clears throat> that resulted in so much deforestation that just this last spring, a mountain slid down on the tiny community of Angangueo, killing 17 people and wiping out hundreds of homes. Most of that wood is destined for a fire that looks just like this one. It's a very inefficient fire. It's a dangerous fire, creating thousands of awful childhood burns. And Mama and her children, in the course of a normal cooking day, will inhale the equivalent of five to seven packages of cigarettes a day. Globally, 1.7 million women and children die every year from the effects of these indoor cooking fires. The impact on global forests rivals that of all commercial logging combined. It's not all that great for the butterflies, either. Much like poking holes in your blanket at home, the thinning of the forest prevents it from holding the heat that's necessary to sustain the butterflies through a cold winter, and they die by the millions. The solution might be a simple one, at least part of the solution. A stove, a stove with a chimney to vent the smoke outside and reduce respiratory ailments by 40%. A stove that reduces fuel use by 70% and makes their harvest more sustainable. A stove that encloses the fire 
so that children and adults are not prone to burns. And finally, a stove that provides for a family with now their needs better met, a connection to a butterfly. A butterfly worth saving for both its spiritual and its economic value. Once this is done, we have a simple solution that addresses deforestation and climate change. It affects health and safety. It affects watersheds and timber resources, butterflies, and a way of life. You'll remember the emotional shock in Bambi was when Bambi's mom was shot. But the real threat to all the wildlife was a forest fire. Hunting is easy to ban. Forest fires are not. And around the world, we have a forest fire. We know, beyond a doubt, that the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge will be desecrated for oil, much as the Arabian Oryx Reserve was, if we decide that we need it. Years of work done by conservationists and by organizations and governments will be undone if we believe we need the resources that are there. The answer has to be in sustainable community-based conservation, and not the community-based conservation that hires a guard or trains a guide. Community-based conservation that improves the health and well-being of every individual and every family. Only then will our conservation efforts have the long-term value to protect Bambi and the forests. We all have to recognize that in the end, the chore ahead of us now is not just to save a species or a bit of habitat, but to save ourselves and a future for our children. Thank you very much.